welcome everybody to this event, A Fusion Future. Uh, my name is Dane and I'm the director of the festival. I'm going to introduce uh, Nick and Katie from the UK Atomic Energy Authority, UKAA, and they're going to talk you through a fusion future. There'll be an opportunity for Q&A afterwards. And at the bottom of your screen, there should be a Q&A box. Please type your questions into that. Uh, but without further ado, I'll pass on to Nick. Welcome. Hello, everyone. And thank you very much for the introduction, Dane. And welcome, everyone, to tonight's uh, event at the Oxford Festival. Um, we'll just get our screens up. And as Dane uh, kindly said and introduced us, tonight's session is all going to be about looking towards a fusion future. Just one extra bit of housekeeping to say to you uh, for this event in particular tonight. If you have a portable uh, mobile device to hand or you have the access to an internet browser, we will be doing a little interactive feature in our event and using a website called menti.com. So you can either load that up now. It's menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com. And we'll put that in the chat as well. Or you can leave that for a few minutes um, because that's going to be coming up um, towards the sort of middle part of our presentation. So without further ado, we will begin I'll work towards a fusion future. Okay. So we'll, we'll start by, by actually saying that the world is at a turning point right now. If nothing is done, the world is going to be irreversibly damaged by climate change and everyone and all life on Earth is going to see the effects of that. In the last 20 years, just in the UK alone, it's seen average annual rainfall be increasing. And with that comes increased risk of flooding. And the damage that's being caused by flooding is not only going to be stretching our emergency and rescue services, but also causing damage to people's homes and impacting people's lives, leaving so many with so little. Looking across the ocean towards the United States, in California, there have been days of wildfires raging across this state in recent months and increasingly over the few, last few years. Even just last month, there were ash clouds covering San Francisco, turning its daytime skies from blue to this dark red or orange sky is caused by ash in these smoke clouds scattering light. Now these are just two examples of the impacts of global warming and climate change. Now, one of the main contributors, as I'm sure we're all aware, is burning fossil fuels to produce energy. However, we do need to recognise that our modern life relies on energy production. For starters, without it, you wouldn't be able to watch us on Zoom tonight <laughs> or take part in a lot of the festival events that are happening at it. What I want you to do is actually just take a moment right now to look around you and see what is using energy in your home or in the room you're in right now. And this is where you can get involved with us and be a bit interactive. So if you go to that website that uh, has been put in the chat there, and it's on the screen now, www.menti.com. And if you enter the code that we'll also put in the chat, and that's on the screen, the code for anyone listening to us is 1994735. And once you've got into that site, 
you'll see a question asked to you. What things around you right now are using energy? And you can actually sell us up to three different things that you're using. And we get to see all of your results coming in live. And this is really awesome, just seeing all the different results that people are already putting in. So we've got things from TV, computer, probably what you're watching us on now, uh, lights, Wi-Fi, iPads, boilers, Nintendo Switch, nice. <laughs> See, there's lots of things in your life that are using energy all the time. And for all of these things, we need electricity. So we're going to switch back now. Thank you very much for getting involved with that. It's great to see. So you've just shown us lots of different ideas of things that are using energy right now. It just shows the breadth of things, really. And here are just three things that we thought uh, you might have been using. Smartphones, kettle, and lights. Certainly there's a lot of people saying they're on their phones right now and the lights are on for me uh, because it's in the evening. You may have made a cup of tea to set yourself in for this talk. Right. Now, I'm sure we can all appreciate that we want to continue having this way of life and hopefully even improve it, having an even higher quality of life going towards the future. To do that, we do need to have ways of producing energy. Now, it is still true that at the moment, fossil fuels are one of our major ways of producing energy. Yes, they are contributing towards climate change. However, if you even just for a moment ignored the impact of climate change and assumed that we wanted to produce energy and that climate change wasn't going to be impacted by fossil fuels, we'd be facing another threat very soon. And that is a looming energy crisis, because actually fossil fuels are reducing. They're a non-renewable resource and we're running out of them fast. So together, these threats of climate change and the energy crisis are really impacting what our future could look like very soon. So we need to find ways to overcome these challenges. Now there are ways out there at the moment uh, of using alternative energy solutions to help reduce the impact of climate change. I'm sure you're all familiar with a lot of these. We could use solar panels to harness sunlight. We can use turbines to convert energy from the wind. And we can harness the power of the flow of water itself and tidal power to give us hydroelectric and tidal energy. Now, all of these energies, in fact, have a big drawback. And because they rely on natural resources, that drawback is that they are intermittent and unreliable. However, that is also its biggest strength relying on natural resources. It means that they can be a clean and sustainable way of us producing energy in the future. And we really want these to be part of our future energy mix. There are other ways that we could try to address climate change as well. We could address the issue of carbon dioxide head on and try to uh, develop more technologies like carbon capture and storage, where they take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and store it deep underground in specific geological rock sites, trapping the carbon dioxide with it. We could also be reducing our carbon dioxide by planting more trees and reducing deforestation across the globe. And we could be doing, looking at using even cleaner modes of transport. And another energy solution should be developing all of, of this sustainable nuclear technology. Now, sustainable nuclear technology is actually very important as a solution towards reducing the impact of climate change. Nuclear fission is nuclear energy that we have at the moment, and it doesn't produce any carbon dioxide. It works by taking large heavy atoms and splitting them apart. And every time that happens, 
we get a release of fission energy. And we can actually get a lot of energy from these nuclear sources, and in fact, we do. Now, it is true that there are drawbacks to nuclear as well. Um, however, it is considered, it is actually a very safe technology. When you look at the number of accidents and sadly the number of deaths that happen in other areas of the energy sector, the amount that actually happens as a result of any issues with nuclear sites is very, very low. So with all of these energy solutions, you might be thinking, why do we even need anything else? Well, the key thing is, is that we really want to develop these solutions, but we're very much aware that alone, they are not going to be the entire solution. We need to still be looking for other things that can get us over that hill and towards the sustainable high quality future that we want. And to do that, we might just want to look towards the stars for our solution. Now, the sun is actually our local fusion energy reactor. Nuclear fusion is the ultimate energy source of stars like our sun. And it powers really everything in the universe because ultimately all of the power from stars comes from fusion which then gets converted into their heat and light going across the universe but how does fusion actually work and how can we make fusion here on earth well to understand fusion we first off just need to think about an atom now a lot of you will probably be familiar that an atom is made up of a nucleus and its central core and around that nucleus are whizzing electrons. Now the nucleus of atoms is where nuclear energy comes from and where the term nuclear energy comes from. To get fusion all we need to do is start off with two small light atoms and under the right conditions we can force together these atoms so that they fuse and create this larger atom and release fusion energy alongside it. But getting those conditions is the really tricky part. Now the sun and stars do this really well. One of the first conditions that we actually need is to think about what state of matter the atoms are in. So if we think about what atoms are like when they're in a gas. They're moving around independently of each other and can be quite fast, but the atoms are still, can, uh, still intact. They have that positive nucleus in the center represented by our plus or cross with the yellow circle, and they've got that electron, which is the blue arrow, going around it. Now, we need for fusion to get to a plasma state. Now, plasma is the fourth state of matter, and to reach atoms in a plasma state, we need to superheat a gas. So just like you, when you heat up a solid, it melts, turns into a liquid. When you heat up a liquid, boils, turns into a gas. When you superheat a gas, it turns into plasma. And what happens to the atoms when they turn into plasma is that that nucleus starts to get separated off from the negative electrons. And the positive nuclei can actually move around completely separately from everything else in the plasma state. So stars have atoms in the plasma state, but what is the fuel of stars? Well, the majority of our sun, and in fact a lot of stars, is made up of hydrogen. And ultimately, it's hydrogen that's going to fuse together to release fusion energy. Now, the atoms need to be in a plasma state, but they also need to be incredibly hot. The temperature inside the sun's core gets up to 15 million degrees. It's almost unimaginable for any of us here on Earth because there's no temperature like it. Another key condition that's needed is incredibly high density. 
these plasma particles need to be packed in really tightly. In fact, in the core of the sun, they are 150 times more dense than water. And the third and final key condition that we need for fusion inside stars is incredibly high pressures. The sun's core gets up to 250 billion bar. Now, what does that mean? What is 250 billion bar? Well, if we compare it to Earth, if you were to just stand outside, you would experience one atmosphere of pressure or one bar. Now, that's not very much at all. If we tried to find somewhere else on Earth that had higher pressure, we could go to the highest pressure on the Earth's surface, which is deep in the Mariana Trench. Now there, at the bottom of the ocean, you would experience about a thousand bar. Still a really long way off, aren't we? But we could get an even higher pressure somewhere else on Earth. The highest pressure on the whole of our planet is actually in the Earth's core, just like the highest pressure in the sun is at the sun's core. Now the pressure inside the Earth's core is three and a half million bar. Sounds a lot, but again, when you compare it to the sun, we're still billions away. And it really just shows you how extreme these conditions are inside stars. Now they need to be that extreme for fusion to happen. When you have a plasma state, if there aren't those conditions, those two positively charged nuclei will want to repel each other, just like the two same poles of the magnet. If you add those conditions, however, you can overcome this electrostatic force of repulsion and join these atoms together to fuse and release fusion energy. Now, that's how it happens on side, inside stars. And we're now just going to have a quick whistle stop tour of how we actually make that happen here on Earth. So at the Cullen Centre for Fusion Energy, we use a fusion reaction that's similar to the sun, but slightly different. So just like the sun uses hydrogen, we use hydrogen too, except it's in heavy forms of hydrogen, which are isotopes called tritium and deuterium. And when tritium and deuterium fuse together, they release these two products of helium and neutron. And actually, it's the neutron that's key, because the neutron receives a lot of the energy and becomes very energetic. And ultimately, we're able to extract the energy from that neutron into electricity. But we need a machine to do this. We can't just have fusion happening anywhere. So to achieve those fusion conditions, we add tritium and deuterium as gas, and then just like in the sun, we have to turn it into plasma. So we add lots of heat into our machine. And then we need to actually keep it inside the machine. And to do this, we use very powerful magnetic fields. And we use magnets because it actually turns out that plasma is charged and charged things can be controlled and shaped using magnetic fields. But we don't just leave our plasma as an empty tube or as a sort of long tube. We curve it round and make it into this donut ring shape known as a torus. And that helps us make fusion energy very efficiently. And this is what our machine is like if we were to see a diagram of it. This is called a tokamak. And on the tokamak, we have a few features. We have two sets of magnets. We have the toroidal magnets, which are those blue D-shaped rings that the arrow is pointing at, and they help to keep the plasma in the torus shape itself. And the other magnet set, the pleroidal magnetic fields, are gray, uh, gray rings going around the outside. And what they do is they help to force the plasma away from the walls, keeping it inside our machine and making sure the rest of the machine doesn't get damaged. And the final key feature is what you can see in the middle there. This is called the central solenoid transformer. And this works to create a current within our plasma. 
making sure that the plasma is going round, but also helping to add to the extreme heat that we're going to experience. Now, how do we achieve the extreme temperatures? And in fact, how hot do we have to get inside the top mark? Well, the answer to the second is we have to reach temperatures of up to 150 million degrees. And the key eye of you there uh, that are watching will notice that that is 10 times hotter than the core of the sun itself. And we have to get hotter than the sun because stars have so many other advantages over us. So to achieve that extreme temperature, we have three heating systems. The first is called ohmic heating, and that works using that plasma current I told you about. When we have a really high current, we can create lots of resistance, which then we can get turned into temperature that we can use to heat our plasma. The second is radio frequency heating. And this is where we fire in electromagnetic waves tuned to particles in the plasma, just like you might be heating your food with a microwave. So these radio frequency heating just helps to add another step of heating power. And the third and final one is possibly the most complicated. It's called neutral beam injection heating. But put very simply, all this works is by firing up a line of high energy particles, a beam of high energy particles, and stripping away their charge. If we didn't strip away the charge, then they start interacting with the magnetic field and we don't want that. So we can put in this beam of neutral particles that have lots of energy, and when they collide with the plasma inside the top mat, then they transfer all of their energy to the plasma itself, helping to create that third and final key heating element. So together, these three systems help us reach extreme temperatures and contributing to one of the key conditions for fusion. Now, where is all of this happening? Well, we are representing the UK Atomic Energy Authority, or UKAA, and we are based at the Cullen Science Centre in Oxfordshire. And on this site, there's actually lots of other scientific and engineering companies working to create new technologies for the future. Now, at UK, our overall mission is to develop sustainable and commercial fusion power. So to do that, you'd expect our main features to be fusion machines. And in fact, that's absolutely true. We have two key fusion devices on site. The first is called JET, and we'll take a little bit more of a look at that later. And then the second is MAST Upgrade, which is still another top mat, but it's a slightly different design. We believe it's going to be more efficient and will help us achieve commercial fusion even faster. Now we don't just do fusion because there's other areas that are needed to support this mission and also expand our technology base. Now this is why we have RACE, which is our robotics facility. And we also have the MRF, which researches a lot of key material science for fusion and wider nuclear technologies. If you're interested in any of these, uh, do come along to some of our other events at the festival. Now, JET is the joint European Taurus and is the largest fusion device in the world and the only one capable of using tritium and recreating that fusion reaction. This is what JET really looks like inside. It's a huge machine, about three stories high, and incredibly complicated. It's given us lots of plasma physics data and lots of valuable science to help us understand fusion and how to create it even better. But what we're now moving from is an era of scientific discovery and understanding towards overcoming lots of engineering challenges and it's when we overcome these engineering challenges that we can work towards our fusion future. Which is what we're going to show you a little glimpse of next.
So we've seen how fusion is going to work, but what is a fusion future going to look like? Well, how would you imagine fusion? Sci-fi likes to imagine fusion. Um, it's one of the favorites of explaining how this advanced tech is going to work in the future. Um, if you've seen Iron Man, you'll know that his suit is powered by what's called an arc reactor, which is basically a fusion reactor that lives in his chest. Uh, in Back to the Future, the, in the second one, uh, he adds a fusion device to his machine to allow him to time travel, which uses rubbish and the hydrogen from the rubbish as a fuel to power it. And sci-fi loves explaining space travel in realistic ways. And fusion is a pretty good way to do that. If you've seen Interstellar, you'll know that the fusion, uh, the spaceship is powered by a fusion reactor to allow it to travel all these distances. But this is sci-fi. What is a fusion reactor actually going to look like? So we heard about JET earlier. Um, so we're actually now going to get a virtual reality tour of what the inside of JET is really going to look like. If we can get the VR going. So this is our virtual reality version of JET. Um, it's a little bit tidier than the actual image. You can see down the bottom in the right uh, what it actually looks like, uh, where there's a lot of more things going on. There's a huge amount of machinery happening there. And if we go inside the vessel, we can see some of the components that we've got happening here. So inside the plasma, while it's contained by magnets, it's still going to get quite hot. And sometimes we can get disruptions, and they can touch the inside of the vessel walls. So they're lined with these tiles that are made with beryllium and tungsten, because they're quite heat resistant. Um, if you look at the back as well, you can see what looks like a kind of radiator. Um, that's, that's actually the, uh, the RF heating, the radio frequency heating. Uh, the little gap you see there as well is the neutral beam injection. So that's where the particles are fired into the plasma. Uh, the kind of bit that you see in green, they are, these are called limiters. And essentially, they kind of bounce the plasma back. So they help with control to allow it to kind of, yeah, stay stable when it gets a bit messy. Um, and if you look down at the bottom here, uh, this is called the diverter. Um, once the fusion reaction has happened and the deuterium and the tritium have fused, they produce helium. And that helium is useful because it does add some energy back to the reaction. But once it's used up that energy, it then just becomes ash essentially and needs to be removed from the plasma, otherwise it will take away some of the heat. So it's pumped down through this diverted region um, and into the exhaust. Uh, so what we can actually see now is what a jet pulse looks like in operation. Um, So that is a standard jet pulse. Um, it's quite short, and that is because the magnets actually get too hot in jet, and they need to have a break between each pulse to cool down. Uh, jet pulses uh, quite a few times every single day, um, each pulse collecting different amounts of data and running different experiments. Um, but yeah, it's quite a big sort of inside. So yeah, that, that's a little bit of an insight into what JET looks like. Um, but JET is current. JET is current technology that exists now. Um, in, it's been ins insanely useful in developing the field of fusion and providing us with a lot of data. But where are we going to go next? Well, the next to be built uh, will be called ITER. And ITER is basically a scaled up version of JET. And it's going to be about 10 times bigger uh, and will aim to produce this net power that uh, fusion needs. So by net power, I mean that the energy in uh, is greater, uh, is less than the energy that's coming out. So we're actually getting energy and power out from this fusion reaction. Um, ITER has been an enormously collaborative uh, project with seven different uh, countries actually taking part 
in building this project, each kind of contributing different components uh, to the reactor. So it's all kind of been shipped in. Uh, it's been built in the south of France in Cadarache um, and it's currently in the assembly phase, which if you have a look on YouTube, there's a lot of really cool videos of all these enormous pieces kind of coming together in these different countries and being built up. And when I say enormous, uh, this is part of what is called the vacuum vessel, which is where the plasma is contained. And we saw in JET uh, kind of that the vacuum vessel is quite a small section and it's surrounded by a lot of other things. So when I say this is just a vacuum vessel and this is a person, you can kind of see just how big this thing is going to be. Um, but E2 is still going to be an experiment. Uh, we're going to get a huge amount of data out from it and it's going to be insanely useful for a lot of people. But it's not going to produce power that goes to the grid. To do that, we need to look at slightly different technology and work towards building a power supply plant. So there's a project called Demo, which is uh, been worked on by people all around the world and is looking at designing what a fusion power plant is actually going to look like. There's quite a few people here at UKA working on this as well. Um, it's a hugely collaborative sort of program where all the data that we'll get from ITER and other reactors around the world will kind of come together to work out what is exactly we're going to need for this. Um, and a little bit closer to home, uh, you may have heard in the news that the UK is actually launching its own program alongside them, looking at a slightly different reactor design um, which is a more spherical shape. The demo reactor will be based on JET, which is the torus, like a donor. Uh, this is called, this project is called STEP, and it will be a more sort of, it, it's, spher it's called a spherical tokamak for energy production, and it will be a slightly narrower reactor, um, and so we're aim for slightly more intense uh, confinement. Um, part of the remit for the STEP design is not just to build this uh, fusion reactor design, but it's also to kind of build up the supply chain that's going to be needed to allow for fusion reactors to be built. Um, it sort of enable industry and academia to have the knowledge and capability so that we can build all these reactors for the future. Um, and I mentioned that ETA was hugely collaborative, but it goes beyond. There's countries all over the world that have got these fusion reactors going. This is just a map of some of the biggest fusion reactors. Um, there's plenty of smaller ones as well. And in the last sort of 10 years or so, uh, there's been a lot of private industry that's gotten interested in fusion. And this kind of, uh, this diversity of uh, approaches towards this technology means that we're gonna keep pushing forwards and everyone kind of wants to be the first to do fusion. And that kind of ambition and that drive is almost similar to that of the space race. And if you remember from the space race, like, we did, they didn't just achieve what they set out to do. There was a lot of spin-offs as well. Space sector has allowed us to get hold of uh, better GPS technology, uh, solar cells, um, bio pens, Velcro. There's a lot that's come out from space. So, well, what else could come out from fusion? On a slightly sort of sci-fi uh, tangent, um, the magnet technologies that have been used for fusion could also enable other things. Particle accelerators also need magnets. So in hospitals, we can develop these technologies further. Uh, remote handling is also used in uh, fusion to access the vessels where we can't quite get in these with very harsh conditions. And if we can get inside the harsh conditions of a tokamak reactor, where else can we go? Well, why not space or to the bottom of the oceans? And we've seen these harsh environments that fusion reactors are going to undergo, and that's going to push material technology further and further. So why couldn't we develop something like a space elevator? At the moment, this is a slightly sci-fi uh, strange approach, but it's limited by the fact that no uh, materials are sort of robust enough to be able to build this, but perhaps fusion could do that. Um, and of course, the never-ending one for sci-fi is space exploration. If we put a fusion reactor on a spaceship, we're not limited by remaining in the solar system as we are currently. Spaceships can't really go further because solar cells don't have access to energy. But a fusion reactor does, and it could potentially keep going infinitely. But there is a more imminent need for fusion. We need more energy, and that's only going to increase. And we've got this current energy mix where we've got renewables such as solar and wind, but they don't operate all the time. And nuclear, which is incredible, but it's, it has issues with uh, the waste and it being long lived. And of course, we have fossil fuels. But by 2050, we need to go carbon neutral. 
and fossil fuels are just not an option for a, a long-term future. And so we can see that this uh, mix of fuels is mostly made up by fossil fuels at the moment. And if we take those out of the mix, then we're left with this enormous gap. And whilst the others could potentially fill it, it's not going to be enough on its own. So we need something else. And fusion can offer that. Fusion has got a kind of almost unlimited fuel with two lithium laptop batteries and a bathtub of water. You can actually provide enough energy for one person for a lifetime. Fusion also doesn't produce CO2. Uh, and it's also safe. Fusion is quite hard to get going, which means that once the reaction, if anything goes wrong in the reaction, it just stops. We don't get any more sort of anything happening out. We also don't have long lived waste and we can provide continuous energy, unlike uh, other renewables such as solar and wind, which are currently limited by battery technology. Fusion isn't, it could provide that continuous energy source. And so if we, a fusion can provide that missing piece for the energy gap, and it can allow us to have a clean and sustainable planet. And it can allow us to continue living the current lifestyle that we want to be living, but it could also allow for future technologies to be developed further. And maybe we will get hoverboards that we were promised in the 1980s, and perhaps more from that. But to do that, we're going to need something else, and fusion can give that. Fusion can give us energy of the future. And if you're at all interested and more interested in our work into fusion um, and beyond, we actually have quite a few different events uh, at the festival this year. We've been really lucky to be able to be really involved. Um, and hopefully on the screen, uh, if Katie presses next, we should be able to see them at other events that we've got coming up. So uh, next week on Friday, we're going to be involved with the Art of Fusion where we're going to have one of our physicists in discussion with a local Oxfordshire artist. And we'll also have some of these other events as well. So do check us out and check out the rest of the IF Festival programme. There's lots of really cool stuff going on all this month. So I think that means we are now ready to take any questions that you've got. And if you don't get anything answered today, do get in touch with us. Thank you, Nick and Katie, for such a fascinating insight into fusion technology. We do have a number of questions that have come in through the Q&A, so I'm going to take them in the order that, that they were submitted. The first uh, is a question from Denise. Um, what are the dangers associated with fusion? Um, so fusion doesn't really have any dangers. Um, the only things that could potentially go wrong is, uh, so I mentioned that uh, jet is limited because the magnets get too hot. Um, so future reactors will actually look at what's called superconducting magnets, and these have to be incredibly cold. Um, however, because they have to be cold, it means if at any point they heat up a little bit, they do something called a quench. Um, and a quench means that there'll be a lot of current going through it. Um, so potentially the worst that could happen is you're going to get a very hot superconducting magnet, which from a reactor point of view, isn't going to be dangerous, but it is going to be a really expensive mistake, so we don't really want that to happen. Um, the potential other sort of dangers could be uh, the fuel tritium uh, is a toxic uh, material, and so we have to control that very carefully, but there are huge regulations in place, um, and it's, yeah, it's quite well regulated. Great. So um, you just touched on one of the waste products there. Are there any other waste products and are they dangerous and how do you dispose of them? So Fusion uh, produces what's called long-lived waste, where the products from Fusion will have a sort of lifespan of hundreds of thousands of years and yeah, you'll never be able to touch or access them again. Um, inside the Fusion Reactor, because we do produce those neutrons, they uh, activate materials around them. Um, and so these potentially produce uh, low activation waste, which in within about sort of 10 to 100 years will be uh, safe to handle and also safe to be around. So you put them in a box, you leave them, and they're kind of okay. Um, so that is something that's been sort of can be considered, but I mean, every effort has been made to choose materials that are going to have as low activation as possible. Um, it's, yeah, it's just a part of how the technology is going to have to develop. 
Well, that, that's very good to hear. Um, so our next question, uh, again from Denise, was how much is the cooperative jet project going to be affected by Brexit? Yeah, so Fusion is a hugely international and collaborative effort. Um, you saw uh, from our talk that actually there's lots of people all over the world, both from public funded bodies and private companies investing in Fusion. The jet product itself um, is part of the Eurofusion Consortium, which is the group of European scientists that carry out research. And we are funded largely by the European Union for this project. Um, now, Brexit will impact in different ways. Um, but in terms of the JET project itself and running that, there's commitment on all sides to really keep this going and get as much out of it as we can. So we have a lot of support from the European Commission to continue funding of this JET project. And then there's also a lot of support within the UK government to keep this project going on as well. And then this even extends to that next big fusion experiment, ITER. That again is an even more collaborative project as you saw with nations from all over the world contributing. And because we have such a vital role uh, with JET and the science and engineering that we can that we have gleaned and that we can still glean, all of the expertise from our work is going to be key and still vital to projects like ETA and around the world. Great. Um, so I'm going to rattle through a few questions in one now, as I know we're getting fairly close to our scheduled end time. We may overrun by just a few minutes. Um, we've had several people asking how many years off do we think it will be before we have fusion energy realistically? Will it be on tap before the natural world is destroyed? Um, and there was another. Um, and yeah, how long will it take before fusion energy is ready for the power supply? Yeah, so with the demo project, uh, we're looking at a timescale of trying to get uh, that reactor on the grid uh, across Europe by 2050. Um, and then for STEP, which is this new UK design, <coughs> we're trying to push that forward to try and get a prototype fusion device powering some element of the grid by 2040. And then it will be a few years after that for the technology and the private investment to catch up for us to really be powering a major part of the energy mix onto the grid with fusion. Um, in terms of is it going to get there before we need it? Well, we all are very much aware there are impacts of climate change right now. And what we're looking for fusion to be is that future part that's going to keep us sustainable and help reduce the impact of long term climate change. In the short term, we need to be continuing investment in renewables and nuclear fission and alternative uh, ways to reduce climate change. But fusion really will play a really key part in the not too distant future. Fantastic, thank you. So our next question is from Alaric, who's eight. Are we ever going to fuse helium and hydrogen on Earth so that we get three protons? Um, so this is a reaction that could definitely happen. Um, and if you wanted to, you definitely could make it happen. Um, but I think for producing energy, uh, it wouldn't be particularly uh, realistic um, just because it's not going to put much more energy out than you're putting in. Um, but we could do it if we wanted to. Great, and I've got another um, slightly complicated question from my point of view, but might be easy for you to answer. If energy usage follows Moore's law and we end up using massive amounts of hydrogen, releasing helium, what are the consequences of releasing this helium, like we are with CO2 today, on the atmosphere? And that question has come from Matty. So the production of helium um, is actually something that we are not going to release because that helium is very, very valuable. Um, so we're going to capture that helium and reuse it uh, potentially as coolant or in other forms, potentially sell it on to put in balloons. Um, but yeah, no, that helium is not going to be released. It's going to be captured and stored. Well, that, that's a relief. 
Um, another question now from Julian. There was some news about a DT campaign at JET. Is that still going to happen? And when will that be? Yeah, so, yeah, so there, there are some really exciting work still happening right now uh, at Cullen. Um, we have this big DT campaign coming up um, and there's already been a, a lot of work really coming to the fore with that. And the key bit about this next DT campaign is that it's going to be another time for us to be using tritium and simulating that fusion reaction mix of deuterium and tritium together. And JET is the only machine in the world at the moment that can operate with that fusion fuel. Um, so it's going to happen really soon. We have actually amazingly um, been working throughout uh, the COVID pandemic. Um, we've had a set of key staff keeping the machine running because these are such key scientific endeavours that we've really tried to pull out all the stops to keep the experiments going as much as we can. So just to clarify there, Nick, DT is... D oh, sorry, yes, I should have explained that. Uh, so DT stands for deuterium and tritium. So sometimes when we refer to our fusion fuel mix of deuterium and tritium, we just shorten it to DT. Great, thank you. Um, um, a question from Ashwina. Uh, we talk of making bigger and bigger reactors. What's the smallest reactor that can be built and the cost associated to it? And could it in the future, oh, I've just lost it. Could it, in the, uh, could it be in the future to have one of the, one that powers electric vehicles? Go for it, Casey. Um, so I think current technology does require some size. Um, I, yeah, I think making it sort of Iron Man size is um, definitely not currently feasible. But who knows in the future, but maybe more realistic would be that if battery technology catches up, we can make the electricity that go to your battery that can power your electric vehicles, um, which eh, is in an indirect way, you're powering all these things with fusion power. Thank you, Katie. Um, so our next question, um, is the private sector set to make a lot of money or establish monopolies in this sector if they're successful? Yes, very much so. Um, I think whoever's going to be the first to crack fusion um, has the monopoly on the market because they can sell that design for the reactor to energy companies. And if it is viable and it's a realistic thing for people to build, then yeah, they're going to make a lot of money from having this technology as their own, which is kind of why there's a lot of private industries have started start to become involved. But that means it's exciting because people want to, to achieve this and to make this technology happen. Now that people are pumping money into it, that's only going to progress yeah. okay. But someone will make a lot of money out of it as well. Yeah, that's, that's the hope. Some of them are taking gambles maybe, but yeah, it's got to be done. Great. Um, and a question from Stuart. Um, do you think that the huge engineering problems that have to be overcome before a fusion future becomes reality will be solved in time for us to be carbon zero in 2050? So engineering challenges for fusion are currently, they're trying to be addressed to, well, to produce a fusion reactor design by the, depending on the programme, but at some point in the future, um, they will be addressed. Um, so the engineering challenges, kind of working up to the fusion plant, uh, are not going to be an issue. But to do it before 2050, you kind of need to be doing it now. Um, and unfortunately, fusion is not going to provide the future of the current, but it could provide the future of the, ener the energy of the future. And do you think fusion will provide all of our power needs? And, uh, so that the last two questions are very much kind of like linked how many power stations or fusion might we require and will it be entirely powered by fusion in the future? The answer is very much no. Uh, we believe that fusion will play a key part of the energy mix um, but we're still going to want to have these other renewable and other technologies alongside and there's lots of advantages as to why you might want an energy mix with lots of different uh, com complementary uh, sources um, and we're just trying to make 
um, fusion a really vital part of that. It might well be that that becomes the dominant power source in years to come. Um, but what we're really keen on is developing all the other technologies alongside fusion as well. Great. And our final question, which I think we did actually cover in part earlier, was how dangerous is fusion? I know you did mention that earlier, but is there anything to add to that? Not really. It's yeah, no more dangerous than I don't know any other industrial plant of any sort would be that's making your crisps or your cereal or yeah. Okay, and one very last question that's just popped in, and we'll make this our last one as we're now slightly over time. So seeing as fusion energy will produce a lot of energy, are there any worries about how to store that energy? As in, if battery research doesn't catch up? So I think the plan for fusion will be to work, treat it as a current power station so that it will feed energy directly onto the grid and there will be no need to store it. it because it because will be running continuously, you can keep on supplying a continuous form of energy. And if you're getting too much, then you can just you know, post it, ship it elsewhere where we do need it. Um, so I don't think there'll ever be a need to store it because I think there'll always be a demand for what exists. Well, thank you for answering all of those really interesting questions that have come from our audience. Um, is there anything else that anybody wants to add at this point? Dane, did you want to say anything? Uh, but I think we've had a really good chat tonight. Thanks so much for all the questions. Thanks for coming. It's been really, really interesting to find out what people want to know about and get the answers from people who are working in these sort of science and technology sectors. Um, so I would like to give a digital round of applause uh, to our panellists and thank all of our attendees for coming tonight and asking some great questions. Thanks so much.